Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione. I'm the interim director of, of NITEX, and uh, I'm very happy to be able to introduce to you this afternoon Dr. Uljana Hesse. Uh, Uljana uh, is working at the University of Western Cape in the Department of Bio. Uh, technology, <clears throat> and she's a genomics uh, specialist, as you can see also from the title of the uh, of the talk. Yeah. Um, um, over uh, her career, uh, Ujana has spent time at um, at the plant pathology department of the University of Kentucky in the U.S. Uh, in the Faculty of Forestry of the University of British Columbia. Uh, at the Michael Smith Genome Sciences Center in, in Canada and more closer to home at Sunbi and IMBM at the University of the Western Cape. Yeah, she's a prolific uh, author in a uh, very renowned uh, uh, journal. And since uh, 2016, um, she has been establishing the Medicinal Plant Genomics Program at the University of the Western Cape. Yeah. And, um, and she will speak about probably an aspect of that uh, to us uh, today. Yeah, I'm very uh, happy that, that, that Ujana offered to give a talk because as you know, uh, quantitative biology and bioinformatics are uh, one of the teams of, uh, of NITEX. And it's very important for us to have uh, more talks in, uh, in the disciplines that, uh, uh, that belong, in all the disciplines that belong to NITEX. Yeah. Uljana, you're already sharing your, your, your screen, um, so you're most than welcome to, to start your presentation. Uh, and I just need to do the standard reminder to the participants to please use the Q&A facility to ask questions. And at the end of the talk, you will be able to raise your hand and we can give you the right to, to ask a question uh, in, in person. So Uljana, please, over to you. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to present today about the Roibos Genome Program. Um, this program actually serves as a pilot project to establish all methods for plant genome sequencing um, and data analysis here in the country, and this will hopefully jumpstart uh, plant genome analysis in South Africa. Just a second. Why is this not moving? Uh, I apologize. No ah. problem. Ah, does it work? Yeah. Uh, okay, we'll have to do it like that. Okay, um, sorry about this. Let me first recap some of the important terms that the non-biologists might in the audience might not be using on a daily basis. Um, so all organisms consists of cells and each cell has uh, the entire manual to recreate that organism um, and that manual is the DNA, our genome. The genome is present as long molecules of DNA, the famous double helix, which itself consists of paired nucleotides, um, also called base pairs. So adenine and thymine is one pair, and then guanine and cytosine is another pair. So when we're sequencing a genome, we end up with a strings of A, G, T's, and C's, as you can see here, which represents one of the strands of the double helix. Now, when unwrapped, the genome of each cell is approximately two meters long. But in the cell, each uh, DNA molecule is supercoiled and uh, into uh, and, and basically it's supercoiled into a chromosome. So the human genome has consists of uh, 23 chromosomes. And uh, the, these 23 chromosomes in, uh, enclose a total of 3.2 billion base pairs. So 3.2 of these pairs, which is the human genome size. Um, however, 
most of the cells in our body have two copies, which means that they are diploid. And one copy is from the mother and the other copy is from the father. So the diploid genome of the human consists of 46 chromosomes and 6.4 billion base pairs. Okay. Sorry, I'm talking from my husband's computer, so I will have to adjust to that. Um, now let's talk about genes. Genes are locations on the genome that contain instructions on how to make the main tools and building blocks of the cell, which are the proteins. Um, if basically the entire genome is your manual, then the genes are the words in the manual. Not all genes are switched on at all times. That makes sense because you don't need the gene for eye color switched on in a brain or a muscle cell. When a gene is switched on, so if this is the location on the genome that encodes a gene, then uh, the cell generates a working copy, which is called messenger RNA. And this process is called transcription. So you are transcribing the gene into a working copy molecule. Then these copies can be easily degraded, which is sensible because you don't need the gene to be switched on all the time. You can regulate whether it's switched on or switched off. Now, the working copy, the messenger RNA, is then it serves as a matrix to uh, bind amino acids into a peptide, a string of uh, amino acids, which is called a peptide. And these peptides are then part of, mole of the molecules, which are the proteins. So the entire process is called gene expression. Okay, let's talk about a little bit about plants. Um, besides food, plants are used to produce a wide variety of compounds uh, that we use in daily life, such as oils, waxes, raisins, and so on. For the pharmaceutical, for the food, and for the cosmetics industry, the medicinal plants are of particular interest because they produce compounds that have beneficial health effects. So in most cases, these compounds are secondary metabolites. Let's explain this term. Secondary metabolites are plant compounds that are not essential for survival. So primary metabolites are involved in plant survival. For example, all the molecules that are essential for uh, photosynthesis, they are primary metabolites. Secondary metabolites assist in niche adaptation which is usually uh, adaptation to biotic and abiotic stress. Say, for example, a plant needs to conquer an area where you have specific insects, um, then uh, the, the, one, the plants that produce compounds which deter the insect from feeding would be more resistant. And uh, that compound most of the time is a secondary metabolite. It's not necessary for survival. Um, we recognize four classes of secondary metabolites in plants, which are terpenes, phenolic compounds, nitrogen-containing compounds, and sulfur-containing compounds. Um, here are some example, which is menthol, which you should know. Then PPAC from rooibos, which is a phenolic compound. We will talk later about it. Um, and nitrogen containing compounds are, for example, alkaloids and morphine is one of them. And an example for sulfur containing compounds is uh, sinigrin, uh, which is a glyphosinolate, which is used in cancer treatment. Okay, um, 
Now, how do we access these compounds in mass for medicinal compound production? Um, the first way is through agriculture. So you uh, generate masses of plant material and then you can extract the compound. But this requires that you have a well-established agricultural system where the plant material is provided on a consistent basis and the quality is also consistent. Um, an alternative method to produce these medicinal compounds is by synthesizing them chemically. So if you look at these two examples, menthol and pipac, both of them are plant derived. So menthol, for example, is produced uh, by from mint plants, but you can also synthesize this compound chemically in the lab. So the production is quite easy. Um, the same is true for pipac. Uh, but most of or many of the plant compounds that have uh, interesting um, characteristics or medicinal, medicinal uh, characteristics, they are very big, like morphine and complex. So uh, in order you, even if you can produce them through chemical synthesis, it is, would be way too expensive, which brings us to a third way of producing these compounds, which uh, is called synthetic biology. Let me explain synthetic biology a bit better. So you all have heard of genetically modified organisms. Um, most famous example is the one where you have the glyphosate resistant corn which basically, uh, where basically one gene was introduced so that the corn uh, does not die when it's sprayed with glyphosate or Roundup. Synthetic biology is something a bit more complex. Um, the th so simply speaking, it's the application of engineering principles for targeted redesign of organisms to produce desirable compounds. Um, to explain that, it implies that instead of using just one gene, which will result in one protein, gene cassettes of sequences from all kinds of origins, this can be from plants, from bacteria, from fungi, from animals, are put together. Um, we can even synthesize molecules of DNA. So you put the genes together into a cassette and then that cassette is transferred into a surrogate organism such as yeast or uh, nowadays the, the, the tobacco plant. And then the compounds of interest, the complex compounds of interests are produced in surrogate hosts. So the land make paper Landmark paper was um, published by Galani et al. in 2015, where they reported that they managed to introduce, to basically to introduce uh, the pathway for producing opioids from sugar in yeast. Um, basically, they introduced, so here is your pathway. Um, all these arrows represent a gene, one single gene, which goes from a single, so you have a, a single molecule, a simple molecule, a sugar molecule, and then step by step by step by step, that molecule gets modified. And uh, these, at the end, you get tebain, which is the precursor for uh, morphium and other opioid drugs. All these genes here that are in gray, they are from yeast. The purple one are from mammals. The orange ones are from bacteria and the green ones are from plants. So basically what synthetic biology means is that we are generating 
small DNA strings, which we use as tools. We are generating a toolbox, and then we modify the organisms to produce the compounds that we need. Morphium, which is usually derived from poppy, was produced in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the culture, in yeast, and it basically implies that it makes us free from this uncertainty when you have to have lots of, uh, so the weather uncertainty, delivery uncertainty, anything, the agriculture is connected with a lot of uncertainties and that is what you get rid of when you are using synthetic um, uh, biology approaches. So you realize that this approach, which is relatively new in biotechnology, has a lot of potential to start producing novel compounds. The absolute prerequisite for that is to know the genes that you need to generate your compound. Uh, which brings us to plant genome sequencing. Um, until recently, plant genome sequencing was uh, prohibitively expensive First of all, because plant genomes can be very big. So pines, for example, have plant genomes that are between 18 and 40 billion bases, uh, which makes their genome sizes nine to 13 times bigger than the human genome. Moreover, plants can have more than two copies of their genomes in the cell. So like four, like the potato has four, uh, wheat has six. Uh, but recent advances in technology, so DNA and RNA sequencing technologies, and in uh, computer power, which is essential for the analysis of big data, have made plant genome sequencing feasible. So consequently, plant genome sequencing has really uh, boomed in the last couple of years, and I would like for you to look at this map. Um, this map was published in January 2021, and it shows you where the locations, the, where the institutes are located that um, publish the genomes, the plant genomes. So as you can see, they are nearly all in the north. They are in the USA, in Canada, in Europe, in China, in Japan. Um, so this does not mean, so if you look at Africa, there is not much happening. If this does not mean that there is not, that the African crops are not being sequenced. The data is in the databases, but the authors of the paper have pointed out that in most cases, these genomes are being sequenced off continent, and even by non-collaborating teams. So in most papers, there is not a single African collaborator in the author list. Um, actually, by January 2021, there was not a single African institution that had led a plant genome sequencing project. Um, this does not only speak about the placement of the scientific credit uh, as it was uh, pointed out by the co-authors, by the authors of that paper. It also has severe implications on the ownership of the data. Okay, now let's look at South Africa. Actually, South Africa is in has an amazing, unique biodiversity hotspot. It is the Cape Floristic region, which is here on this map, located at the very tip of Africa. It stretches from Namibia and all the way to the Eastern Cape. Uh, it harbors 9,000 plant species, uh, and nearly 70% of these plant species are endemic, which means that they are only found in this area on the globe. 
Until very recently, the Cape Floristic region was even considered the sixth floral kingdom of the world. Okay. Um, in addition to that, South Africa has a wealth of traditional knowledge on how to use these plants for medicinal purposes. More than 70% of the population relies on herbal medicines. And uh, the documents have shown that more than 2,000 different plant species are currently being traded and we have indigenous knowledge for over 3,000 medicinal plant species on how to use them for medicinal purposes. What is even more interesting is that uh, an increasing body of literature um, proves that these plants really produce medicinally active compounds and that many of these compounds are actually unique. They can only be found in these plant species which is not surprising. So the plant species are only found here, which means that they have evolved to produce unique compounds for niche adaptation. If you take into account the diversity of the local flora and the wealth of indigenous knowledge on the application of these herbal medicines, then you understand that the local flora of South Africa represents a treasure trove of biosynthetic pathways for potential phytopharmaceuticals. Okay, and now comes the problem. Um, in South Africa, the agricultural production systems that would allow you to uh, have these, uh, to, to, to produce or to extract the medicinal compounds are basically non-existent. They have been established for a very limited number of plant species. And even then, the number of plants that are being grown is very little, very small. Most of the plants are collected from the wild. And in previous times, these plants were protected traditionally through tra traditional taboos. But uh, in recent times, these, uh, this protection is eroding. So the populations, particular of plant species that are very, um, that are very favorited, they are being over harvested. In addition, we are observing habitat loss due to urbanization, due to conversion of uh, habitats to agri for agricultural pol purposes and for um, mining. And in some areas, climate change uh, associated changes in weather, such as prolonged heat and drought periods, uh, start affecting the survival of the plant species. Um, I will have to continue going on like this. So it implies that sequencing plant genomes of these endemical medicinal plants and subsequently trying to establish synthetic biology approaches for the exploitation uh, is a very promising direction for South Africa, which brings us to the Robos Genomics Program which uh, I established in 2015. It is supported through the funds from the NRF and from the University of the Western Cape. Why did I choose rooibos? Okay, let me introduce to the, you to this very interesting plant species. Um, rooibos is a legume that belongs to the genus Aspalatus. This genus is endemic to South Africa, and it includes over 270 uh, plant species. Rooibos is found only in the Cedarberg mountain area of South Africa at sea levels that are at 450 to 900 meters above the, the sea, which is quite high. 
and it loves, really loves deep, well-drained and acidic scent. Rooibos is an important, uh, in, in the region where it grows, rooibos is an important economic crop. The production area is about 70,000 hectares and yearly we produce approximately 20,000 tons, which is actually three times the amount since two, uh, 20, uh, 2015 which is approximately 400 to 600 million rands per annum in uh, revenue. We have smallholder farmers, which are mostly located in the mountainous areas. Very often they um, harvest the bushes very uh, sustainably. So they only take a uh, few leaves and uh, they harvest not every year but this is only two to 5% of the total production. The most of the, boy, of the robots comes from large co commercial farms, which are between five to 50 hectares big, where the rooibos bushes grow for five to six years. And then there is a three year rotation period. So this is done with high impact farming with nitrogen or basically with fertilization and with uh, pesticides and fungicides, etc. Despite, so when I saw, say, um, large commercial production, I have to add that the rooibos is still very much uh, a manually harvested produce. So here is an example of the Fair Wuppertal Cooperative in the area of Wuppertal. So these are the rooibos bushes that you can see here, and they are harvested manually with sickles. Because if you don't know how to, at what area, how high you cut the plant, you can kill the bush. So the plant material is wrapped into sheets and then it gets transported to the rooibos um, fabric, to the rooibos factory, where it is cut into very small, uh, pieces. So then after that, this material is put into heaps and uh, wetted so that overnight it can ferment. In the morning, it has changed color to the typical red brown. And in the morning, it is distributed across a um, drying area, which is basically cement floor. And uh, then it gets dried and within 12 hours you have your tea, which you can then consume. So now most of you have heard about rooibos and have heard that rooibos is healthy, but I don't think all of you realize just how healthy rooibos is. Rooibos has a long standing history of safe application already by the traditional knowledge holders, the Kui Kui and the Sun people. So extensive research proves that rooibos has uh, anti-inflammatory, anti-colic, anti-diabetic, cardioprotective, anti-allergic, and even anti-aging effects. Um, this makes this plant very interesting for medicinal purposes. So the main health effects are associated with a wide variety of um, phenolic compounds that is produced in rooibos. Um, specifically, it produces more than 40 different flavonoids. And these two compounds, which are uh, phenolic compound uh, PPAC and then the dehydrochalcone, which is aspalatin, they are already treated as potential phytopharmaceuticals because many of the health benefits, specifically anti-diabetic and cardioprotective properties are associated with these two compounds. In addition to that, uh, rooibos is rich in minerals, low in tannins, which makes it rather sweet tasting and it's caffeine free. Um, since it is such an interesting medicinal plant, it got a lot of attention nation internationally wide. 
And uh, in 2009, Nestec South Africa, which is a subsidiary of Nestle, uh, actually applied for five patents which involve the use of rooibos and the use of honeybush, which is another endemic plant of South Africa, for the treatment of hair and skin conditions as and as an anti-inflammatory agent. There was a big uprisal, and as a result, Nestle did not get these patents approved, but later on it signed benefit sharing agreements with uh, providers in the country. But this um, situation has actually jump started a very interesting process, which I think is uh, worth knowing about. So, in fact, in 2015, South Africa recognized that the Koi Koi and the San people are the true traditional knowledge holders of rooibos. And in, 2050, uh, in 2019, a very first access and benefit sharing agreement was signed by the rooibos industry and the traditional knowledge holders. So this is an absolute first because here we are not talking benefit sharing between a factory or a company and other people, but a whole industry has pledged to the course of fair trade. And I think this is very important to know because considering how many medicinal plants South Africa has, um, it is, becomes clear that we need to protect not only the plants, but also the knowledge about the application of these plants. Okay, one last interesting aspect of rooibos is that it's not just one plant species, it's a whole species complex. Um, eight rooibos growth types have been described, and I know personally at least three more that I have seen in the, in the felt out, out there. Um, of these eight growth types, only one is used for large-scale commercial production, which is the red type. Um, the other growth types, they are, show a very great diversity in morphological and biochemical characteristics, and uh, they differ in their fermentation abilities and in taste. So if you taste the leaves from different rooibos growth types, you will see that, yes, there is quite a big difference in what you can feel. Um, we distinguish between two main growth forms, which are cedars. These are plants that die during fires and they regrow from seeds. And then we have sprouters, which regrow after fires from a lignotuberose group root. So the red type here, this is our commercial plant, is a cedar. And let me show you two other cedars to make you realize just how big the morphological and uh, differences are. So the Wuppertal type is also a bush, but it's quite flat. And it has, so if you look at the flowers of the red type, you see that they are bright yellow. Uh, the flower of the Wuppertal type has this beautiful dark red um, lip. And this here is also rooibos. This is the black type, and it actually looks more like a tree. It's taller than me, uh, so it's taller than one and a half meters. One, so I'm one meter seventy-five, and the lip here is light purple. Here are two examples of sprouters, which is the gray sprouter and the new Woodville sprouter. Um, you can see a difference in color, and we have also already identified differences in biochemical uh, production. Um, so this now finally brings me to the Roibos genomics program that I'm establishing at University of the Western Cape. My aims are the following. I want to establish locally all tools and methods from sampling to genome database for uh, plant genome analysis. 
I want to generate a high quality genome assembly for rooibos and uh, exhaustively annotate the gene catalog. And then I would like to identify the genes that are used for medicinal compound production that are involved in desirable mor morphological traits for the farmers uh, that are involved in improving the stress tolerance of the plant and that define the development of these different growth types. So I'm already collaborating with Royal Bus producers all over the Cedarberg mountain. And the idea is that we will use this data to develop biomarkers for targeted selection of rooibos plants with desirable um, traits, such as high production of phenolic compounds, drought stress tolerance, uh, high leaf mass, and uh, deep, uh, good root system. But these morphological or these markers can also be developed for trademark protection so basically to ensure that when you have rooibos, uh, when you have a tea bag with the plant material in it, it actually is rooibos and not something else. And then I'm also planning to collaborate with the Biodiversity Institute to develop markers for wild rooibos growth types that we could use then to identify, recognize and protect endangered populations. Okay, let me introduce you to the roadmap, which I have been following. Obviously, the first step is to collect samples, then uh, identify interesting plant genotypes by biochemical screening, then uh, analyze the genes using transcriptomics. So for those that are not biologists, one more time a reminder. So here is our DNA. Some of the genes are switched on and expressed, others are not. Everything that's switched on and expressed generates messenger RNA, and we can harvest the messenger RNA and then read that. So we can, reading in this case, we sequence and then we assemble and annotate these uh, sequences. So that is a comparatively cheap approach when you compare it to genome analysis. And it allows you to identify uh, more, many of the genes that are being switched on and active during a given time point in a given tissue. So it gives you a lot of information. Um, for genome projects, you obviously want to estimate the genome size. You need to know how big your genome is. And then for the genome project itself, you need to establish DNA extraction, DNA sequencing, and then computational analysis, which implies assembly and annotation. Okay, let's see what we have achieved so far. Um, let's talk first about sample collection. Um, we have pretty much sampled all over the natural habitat of rooibos. So we have been from Picketburg all the way to near Woodville and Wuppertal and then in Clan William and Citrusdal and Wittelsklof. Um, in total, we have sampled plants from 35 locations, uh, 300 ecotypes, most of which are uh, commercial rooibos, but also we got samples from nine different growth types. Um, so five plants per population, one to three populations per growth type. So that's a very good representative sample, uh, amount of samples. As I said, the mRNA, so the working copy of the genes is easily degraded. So what needs to be done if you want to do uh, messenger RNA sequencing transcriptomics, you need to um, actually flash freeze your sample in the field with liquid nitrogen. So here are two of my students. This is Alison, here is Jan Kela, and this is Wes. And we drive around in the universe with our doers. Um, we flash freeze the samples, and then we bring the samples home either in a doer or on dry ice. This ensures that the samples are available for 
biochemical and transcriptome analysis. The next step is to conduct biochemical screening. So when we started off, the amount of money wasn't very big and we needed a very cheap method to analyze a largest possible number of plant samples. So my uh, collaborators, Prof. Marnevik and Prof. Marilis uh, Rose Hill from the University of, from CPUT, uh, they developed or we developed a method which is uses thin layer chromatography for biochemical characterization of the plant samples. So basically it allows visualization of phenolic compounds. And as you can see here, these are the different uh, rooibos plants that represent different growth types. We got rooibos plant growth type specific fingerprints. So these are here commercial plants, these three, and these are wild types. And you can see that there is definitely differences in these um, bands. Um, we got lucky because this fat band here turned out to be aspalatin, which is one of the potential phytopharmaceuticals from rooibos. And we were even able to show that uh, unfermented green rooibos tea, we could visualize that, unfermented green rooibos tea has a much higher concentration of aspalatin than the fermented rooibos tea, which is the red tea that we buy in the shops. So these results were published and it allowed us to select um, plants with cost contrasting aspalatin production. Now, um, we, PPAC, which is the other compound that we want to identify the genes for, is uh, not visualized using that TLC method. So we had to revert to high pressure liquid chromatography and uh, which is a much more expensive, but also a much more sensitive method. Basically the chemicals are dissolved in solvents and then they are sent through a column and based on the different uh, so based on different charges for example the columns uh, the compounds leave the column at different times and then you can uh, determine the time point at which they leave the column and this is a separation technique so here is your um, histogram and it shows you that you have this is a peak for aspalatin in the sample. This is a peak for PPAC. And then, but you have also other um, peaks that represent other phenolic compounds. Now in total, we have analyzed 92 rooibos samples, um, which represent nine growth types, the one to three populations per growth type and four plants per population. And these plants come from 17 different locations. And we were able to find that the growth, so what we have found is that the growth types have growth type specific profiles of 12 phenolic compounds, including PPAC and aspalatin. Um, this brings me to the next topic, which is transcriptome sequencing. Um, at the beginning of the project, we sequenced the, or at the beginning of the program, we sequenced the transcriptomes from different rooibos plants that represent different growth types using Illumina High Seq 2500. And my PhD student analyzed four transcriptomes. Um, in total, she generated some 200 million read pairs of a read length of 120 nucleotides. Uh, bio, so now comes the biocomputational analysis, which involves uh, that you uh, assess the read quality. And as I said, the read length is very short when you are using Illumina sequencing. It's only 120 letters in this case, but the average gene length is 3000 
base pairs, so 3,000 letters long. So what you have to do is you use computational assembly programs to reassemble the reads back into the hopefully genes or transcription fragments. Um, this is an assembly process. Then once you have your transcription fragments, you uh, need to check whether they code for proteins. And some of them do code for proteins, others will not. And then you can do functional annotations of these proteins to see what they actually do. And this one, for example, may be a secreted enzyme. And these ones, these sequences that don't encode proteins may just be a misassembly, or sometimes these are RNA molecules that don't have, we don't know what they are doing. So obviously this is not done by hand. Emily uh, first assessed different assembly programs and different programs that allow prediction of open reading frames or protein coding regions on the transcripts. And then uh, she generated a pipeline where you assemble, uh, you predict the open reading frames, and then you annotate, which means functionally give a functional identification for the sequences, whether it was the protein sequences or the nucleotide sequences. This was published in 2020. Okay, and here, let me show you some of the results. So of the four uh, transcriptomes that she analyzed, she had um, two with aspalatin producers and two from uh, non-aspalatin producers. Uh, nearly all of the transcripts, uh, so she, she, oh, geez. She, uh, she assembled between 76,000 and 91,000 transcripts and nearly all of them encoded proteins, so a very high proportion. And when she checked these protein sequences against the NCBI database, she found that the majority of them matched plants, which is good. Many didn't match anything, which is also interesting because they might be rooibos specific. But then she also find a substantial number of fungal matches. Uh, and as you can see here, the commercial plant does not, only the wild types. And that indicates that the commercial plant was actually treated with fungicide. So uh, later on, we managed to isolate an endophytic black yeast uh, from the leaves of these rooibos plants but it grows so long that it's actually my, it grows so slow that I cannot give this project to any of the students. I'm working with it myself. Now, um, this figure here shows you how many of the biosynthetic pathways, how complete the biosynthetic pathways uh, are that we, for which we have found rooibos genes. So you have biosynthetic pathways that are involved in amino acid metabolism, in nucleotide metabolism, in lipid metabolism. And uh, as you can see, in the majority of cases, we were able to complete the pathways and identify the genes that are involved in these pathways. So these transcriptomes represent a very useful source for data analysis, for data mining. Obviously, the main question is, did we find genes that are involved in medicinal compound production? And yes, we did. This is a pathway that was published by uh, Mariette Stander uh, from Stellenbosch University. And she predicted not only the biochemical pathway for uh, PPAC and aspalatin production, but also the genes that should be involved in the conversion of these molecules. And uh, these numbers here, they represent the number of transcripts that we were able to identify in the uh, four transcriptomes. So we found many transcripts and that was uh, the main achievement of that study. Which brings us now to our main, to the last question, 
how far have we come with regards to the genome analysis? As I said, the first step is to analyze the genome size. Um, this was done, this work was done by two students, two of my master's students, Yamkela Mguatiu and Alison Stander. Um, Yamkela used flow cytometry analysis, um, where you basically, what you do is you take the plant cells, you destroy the cell wall that is protecting the plant cell so that only the membrane is left. You add a dye that binds to the DNA and then you use a standard plant uh, where you know the genome size, which is for example, in our case, it would have been P and you use your, and then you do the same, you stain the, the your plant material, your plant cells, and then you compare. So based on that, uh, Yamkela predicted that the genome size of rooibos is 1.2 gigabase pairs, which is about one third of that of the human genome size. Still quite big uh, and challenging enough. She also found that the rooibos growth types do not differ in genome size. What Alison did, she used sequencing data, Illumina sequencing data that we had generated from one rooibos plant and verified the genome size through KMAR analysis. Uh, and she confirmed that it's approximately one gigabase pair. So that work was also published. Okay. So as I said, we had sequenced the rooibos genome using Illumina. Uh, we generated one terabyte of data approximately, which is about uh, 235 times genome coverage. Uh, and the read length was 120 nucleotides. Um, Alison then used assembly programs to reassemble these reads. And she ended up with a highly fragmented assembly. Um, so as you can see, the number of pieces or scaffolds that she got at the end was 200, like was between 70 and 78,000. Uh, the largest scaffold was not very big, only 257,000 base pairs. And the total length was smaller than the, uh, the predicted genome size with 857 base pairs, uh, million base pairs. Um, BASCOs are, the BASCOs are genes that permit us to, so this is a set of conserved genes, which um, permits the assessment to what degree the genome is assembled and has the basic genes in its assembly. And as you can see, there is a high proportion of genes missing. Like here in the Platanus assembly, it was 9%. In the Mazurka, even 35%. That's not a very good result. So this assembly issue is not surprising. Plants have long regions of um, repeats. And so repeats basically where it goes ATG, 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 ATG. So when these regions are longer than 120 nucleotides, you cannot reassemble those areas, which means when you are using just the Illumina sequencing data, you will end up with these highly fragmented assemblies. But luckily we have third generation sequencing technologies available. Um, so Illumina sequencing, the longest read length is 500 nucleotides. The good thing about it, it's highly accurate. Um, the third generation sequencing technologies include PacBio and Oxford Nanabo technologies, which generate much longer reads. So the min ion sequencing technology allows generating up to 1 million nucleotide reads. So that's way longer. They are less accurate, but uh, you should get much better assemblies. However, for sequencing uh, plant DNA using this method, uh, you need ultra pure DNA. By the way, this machine, you need a huge table for, 
here, this is about as big as a jump drive. So it's a very versatile tool. Um, so the moment COVID lifted, Jan Kela went into the lab and started optimizing DNA extraction procedures. And eventually she, she managed to establish a method which yielded high molecular weight DNA, which means that, that the DNA is not shredded into smaller pieces, which allows sequencing of longer reads, and which was of really good purity. Uh, the final uh, protocol is basically a CTAP DNA extraction procedure paired with Kyogen DNA power clean cleanup kit. She then went ahead and sequenced about two terabytes of data, which resulted in 14 million reads um, and approximately 25 times genome coverage. And the maximum read length now was 116 thousand nucleotides. We have in the meantime gotten even better, but that's a different story. And here are our assembly results. So if you look at the Illumina data, you have your better assembly is the mazurka because it has less pieces, longer uh, scaffolds. Um, there are different ways to assemble long read data and short read data. One is a hybrid way. Uh, where you take all the data together. This can be done by Mazurka. And you can see that the number of scaffolds is significantly reduced. And the length of the largest scaffold is now 1.2 million base pairs, which is now we're talking. Um, however, if you look at the Bascos, they're still 13% missing. So then Yamkela also investigated other long read assemblers, which basically first you assemble the wrong reads and then you polish. Uh, the most famous one is Kanu. It was the one where most plant genomes have been assembled today. It didn't do as well as Mazurka in terms of assembly statistics, but the Basco statistics were much better. But then if you look at uh, three of the latest assemblers fly, Red Bean and Next Novo, you see that the number of scaffolds is systematically going down. What needs to be taken care of is that Next Novo seems very good because you have only 5,400 pieces of the like scaffolds and the longest piece is 3 million base pairs. But if you look at the genome size, you see that the genome size is much smaller than was predicted. So Next to Novo most likely over assembles substantially, whereas Fly and Red Bean are much closer to the actual genome size. And if you look at the Bascos, basically we are close to completion when it comes to Basco statistics. So these results were also published. And one last thing that I would like to point out is the following. Um, computational requirements for genome assembly and polishing. Uh, so all the work was conducted at CHPC. And if you look at uh, which programs required most, then it's definitely Kanu. So in total, it used up 35,000 CPU hours and uh, 112 cores, so two fat nodes. And it took a good three to four weeks to complete the job. In comparison to that, Fly, Raven, Red Bean, and Next Novo are much more efficient. Okay, I think my time is nearly up. So last slide, we have used the assembled genome. We are now in the process of annotating the genome, but we have used it already to see whether we can identify genes. And yes, we have first candidates for, so four genes that are conserved in the genome for PAL. Um, this is a P450, we found two genes. We have four, five copies of the 4CL gene. We have two um, charcoal synthases and we have one charcoal isomerase. So, 
ongoing research is focusing on the annotation of the genome, which involves repeat masking, gene prediction, and functional gene annotation. Uh, we are also establishing minion transcriptomics at the moment, uh, which is very successful. We have uh, sequenced already gene, like, transcriptomes to identify genes that are involved in root growth and in nodulation. And uh, we will be looking at genes that are involved in drought stress tolerance. And the side result for the genome assembly are the chloroplast and the mitochondrial genome. So the chloroplast genome is fully assembled and the mitochondrial genome is, uh, it is assembled. It has the right size, but we need to verify now with the long read data whether this is correctly assembled. And with that, I would like to acknowledge all the people that helped, which are definitely all the rooibos farmers from Clan William, Neil Woodville, Wuppertal, Kridu, Vidu, Citrusdal, Wittles, Clove, and Picketburg. Um, Roibos LTD, specifically Johann Brandt and Jan Perang, the Darren Engelbrecht and Ruth Cuttings from the Department of Agriculture, my collaborators from CPUT, Prof. Marnevik and Prof. Marie, uh, Marie-Lise Leroux Hill. My collaborators from the ARC Infrutech, Prof. De Beer and Prof. Joubert, um, Prof. Alan Christoffels and Peter Van Heusten from Sanbi, um, then Werner Janse van Rensburg and Enos Schippers from CHPC, uh, Prof. Trindade and Lonnie Van Zyl from IMBM, Stefan Ferreira, and Stephanie Cornelissen, both of who are from different organizations and who helped us to establish methods. And then the University of the Western Cape, the South African Rooibos Council, the NRF and Food Web Zeta for funds. And last but not least, my wonderful team. These are the mature seasoned students, Jan Kela, who is doing a PhD now with me, Emily, who has finished her PhD, Wes, who was a postdoc, Alison, who did her master's, and Faneshka, that is finishing her PhD. And then here are some rookies, which are Casey, who is doing a master, Tan Weir, who is doing a master, and then Kaelin, who is joining as a master. And then obviously all my former honors students and interns. And with that, thank you so much for your attention and your interest, I'm, I'm ready to ask or answer questions. Uljana, thank you so much for a very, very, very interesting talk. It is, uh, was fascinating to hear all the implication of, of, of rooibos and, 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 and bioinformatics.